Hi, welcome to the Signal Pack. I have picked up an interesting instrument that I'd like to show you guys and go through its uh, type of operation and, and its usefulness. So I have a uh, Hewlett Packard 1189 polarization controller here with me that was actually broken, uh, but I wanted to do the fix on the video for you, but I just opened it up and I touched the power supply cable and came back to life. So there was really nothing wrong with it. It's just the power supply cable was uh, oxidized and it wasn't making good contact to the motherboard inside the unit. So there is no uh, repair, but nonetheless, we can figure out exactly how it works and what it does do. And first of all, what is a polarization controller anyway? And why would anybody make a polarization controller? What is this application? How do we test it? So I'm going to go through all of that today with you guys. So there's a lot of interesting information about fiber optic communication that I will cover today. So before we get to actually do any experiments, I wanted to go over some fiber optic communication theory with you so you can appreciate the importance of why a polarization controller would be built and where and how it would be used in a large system. So at the beginning there will be some theory as always, but hopefully it will be very useful and the documents for the theory that I'm going to go over will be available on the website as well. So you can pick it up and look at it in your own time. And then we will have, I uh, will do some normal, sim some simple experiments and then we'll go ahead and, and figure out how we can actually test and use the polarization controller. So. Let's get started. If you remember in one of my old videos, I did a multi-wavelength uh, uh, data transmission using fiber optics with a red, green, and blue LED. And now there I talk a little bit about different types of constellations that can be used to transmit optical data. But uh, right now I want to go through it in a much more methodical way and, and go through exactly how each of these systems were developed and uh, what type of communication scheme is used to send data in a modern uh, fiber optic uh, system. So you can imagine the simplest way to send data over fiber optic is to basically say if you want to send a zero put, put no light in the fiber and if you want to send a one put all the light that you want in the fiber. So this is a binary decision, it's a NRZ essentially. So you put uh, no light, you get a zero, you put light, you get one, and you're using a single wavelength. Now typically that wavelength is in the infrared region, that's because that's when the fiber optic is, has the lowest loss. For consumer application, people use red lasers so that the consumer can actually see that the light is present in the fiber, but that's just because it's for a short, very, very short reach consumer application. In a real fiber optic system, people use uh, infrared in the, about the 15, 50 nanometer range. So if you want to send just 0 and 1 in this fashion, there's no problem, you use a single wavelength. You can use, a, for example, a single mode fiber, which I will show you later, to send data. And you will use a single polarization. So this is a cross section of the fiber that I'm using, and I'm using this symbol here, this arrow, showing that the polarization is, is at the transmitter is only at a single direction. So you know light can have polarization. It can be polarized in different orientation. So in a fiber, you can either have polarization, let's say, 0 degrees of polarization, 90 degrees, or horizontal or vertical polarization. In that case, in, in the case of the most simple communication, we're using the, let's say, the vertical polarization. Anyhow, it doesn't matter because the single mode fiber is not polarization maintaining, meaning that the single mode fiber, uh, if you put a single, a particular polarization at its input, the output will not preserve that polarization orientation. It will be scrambled. But anyhow, it doesn't matter because we're going to use an intensity detector, like a squirrel law detector, to detect the 0 and 1 anyway, so it makes no difference. So with the simplest mode of communication, we are transmitting a single wavelength. We're doing on and off key modulation, basically just 0 and 1, the most basic modulation you can do. And we're using a single polarization only in one direction, and the data rate is 1x. What I mean by 1x is that... Whatever the fastest you can achieve in here, let's assume that to be normalized our one time, uh, our one X speed. So, well, how can I increase the speed of this channel? Well, I can go to more complex modulation like I showed in one of my previous videos. So if you go down here, there we go. So here's an example of a more complicated modulation. You can see that instead of having just a state of 0 and 1, now I have four different states. And these four different states can now be represented by two bits as opposed to just one bit. So now that the only difference is that instead of just sending no light and full brightness, now I send different intensities of light. So I send no light, a little brighter, a little brighter, and full brightness. And if I can detect the level of brightness as opposed to just the presence and absence of light, I can send more than one bit at a time. And well, then why wouldn't everybody build it this way? Well, you can imagine that building 
a system display is more complicated, the transmitter is more complicated, the receiver now has to detect multiple levels as opposed to just a zero and a one, and also you're more sensitive to noise because the distance between these two points in the constellation represents your sensitivity to noise because these, these points will get crowded by noise around them and you can imagine that for the same amount of noise this guy can actually start making errors and when you send 0, 1 you don't know if whether you send 0, 0 or 1, 0. So this is more sensitive to noise, more complicated but you can still use a single mode fiber and you can still use a, the basic single orientation of polarization. So now you have single wavelength pulse amplitude modulation, so that's a more complex modulation scheme. Now you're still doing single polarization, but because you're doing PAM as opposed to OOK, now your data rate is two times. So let's just as an example, if you were sending one gigabit per second like this, now you can send two gigabit per second if you go to this type of modulation. Well, that's not the end. We can even make it more complicated because just like wireless systems, uh, light has both phase and amplitude, meaning that you can do a two-dimensional constellation. So now you can send 16 points, which will be represented by 4 bits as opposed to uh, only 2 bits. Now, again, why wouldn't anybody do this? Because now you're going to start requiring what's called a coherent receiver, meaning that you need to detect the phase as well as the magnitude. So your receiver has to have a local oscillator a laser that matches the transmit laser so you can extract the phase of the signal that was sent. So that's obviously much more complicated and people do this using digital signal processing at the receiver side. So you can't just do a basic intensity detection anymore, you have to detect not just the intensity but also the phase, just like a wireless system. So this is much more complicated to build but then again you can send much more data using this method. But you still can use a single mode fiber as, you, as we did before. And now you're doing single wavelength still. Only one wavelength of light is used, the same wavelength. Now it's quadrature amplitude modulation. So in this case, this is a 16 qualm signal. And it's still a single polarization, but we have doubled the data rate once again. Going from here to here, now we're sending twice the data. But of course, we're making a much more complicated system. So at this point, but remember that you're not limited to uh, 4 PAM, for example, like this, or 16 QAM, you can do even more complicated, you can do 32 QAM, 64 QAM, and do more and more data. I'm just giving you a basic example of, uh, of a QAM constellation, but it can be made even more complicated than that, and people have done so. Now we come, we come to the magic moment where we talk about polarization. Now if light can preserve polarization, and if we can send the polarization in this direction and in this direction, now the polarization in the vertical and the polarization in the horizontal direction in a good fiber are completely independent of each other. Meaning that whatever signal I send in this polarization can remain completely independent of any signal that I send in this polarization. So we can take advantage of that and do something called polarization multiplexing. So in that case, I'm taking my same QAM constellation, I apply it once on my vertical polarization and I apply it again on my horizontal polarization. But these are totally independent sets of data. So I'm sending twice as much data yet again by taking advantage of the polarization. So here you can see in these symbols, I have drawn these little lines that represent a vertical, uh, vertical polarization. And I'm sending and I've drawn these horizontal lines that represent a horizontal polarization. So these bits that are written vertically down are for the vertical polarization and the horizontal bits are the, for, for the horizontal polarization. Now, what kind of fiber should we be using? Well, it turns out that you can use a single mode fiber still if you have a polarization controller which can adjust the polarization of the light because remember single mode fiber does not preserve your polarization. But there is another type of fiber called PMF, polarization maintaining fiber, which is very expensive. But whatever polarized light you put at this input, at the other side of it, it will preserve the polarization. If its length is reasonably short, it will have exactly the same polarization. Even if you turn it and twist it and shift it, it will not affect the polarization. A single mode fiber, as soon as you bend it, the polarization totally changes. So that's not very useful. But then you're going to have to have a much more complicated system to correct for the polarization scrambling that's happening. But having said all of that, in this scheme, you're sending data in the vertical polarization and the horizontal polarization. So this constellation here is sent in this polarization direction, and this constellation at the bottom is sent in this polarization direction. We are still using a single wavelength. Now we have single wavelength, quadrature amplitude modulation, dual polarization, which we will call polarization division multiplexing, and now our data rate is eight times as much as what we started up here. 
So by going, so you can you can you can see the progression. You have on off keying, multi level modulation, quarter shot amplitude modulation, polarization division multiplexing in order to get to eight times the data rate. But we don't have to stop here. We can take it even further. To take it even further, we're going to let me get this out of the way. Put this here. We, there is nothing that says that we are limited to using only one wa one wavelength. We can use more than one wavelength, and you can use optics to separate your wavelengths from each other. So you can send wavelength number one here. I'm showing that with uh, green and uh, green and red, but they're all in the infrared region, so they're all invisible to the eye anyway. But they're separate from each other far enough not to interfere with each other when there is signal on top of them. So with the Wavelength um, 1, we're going to send our original data. And with wavelength 2, we're going to send another copy of a totally different set of data on the same fiber. Now, in our fiber, we have two wavelengths. We still have our polarization. So now we have dual wavelength, which we call wavelength division multiplexing, quarter chain amplitude modulation, dual polarization, which is polarization division multiplexing. And now we're sending 16 times as much data. We have essentially doubled the data rate we could use with this scheme because we're using exactly this scheme but we're now doing it on two separate wavelengths obviously that doubles our data now nothing is saying that we're limited to using only two wavelengths i'm only showing two here people have used as much as 80 that's eight zero all the way up to even a hundred in research environments 100 different wavelengths on the same fiber uh, with this type of application you can imagine the data rates just explode in, in 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 the number because you can do so much with having multiple wavelengths now you would think that this is the end, but this is not the end. There is yet another advancement that you can apply, which is called spatial division multiplexing. So what we do is that we can have a fiber like this that has more than one core. It means in this same fiber, there is two paths that a light can take. Each of them can have two polarization modes and each of them can have more than one wavelength. So in the same fiber, this is essentially the same as having more than one fiber. It's like having two fibers next to each other that you've kind of squeezed together and put in the same body. And two, two core fibers, you can have even more than two core, but again, here I'm only showing two core. So now we will send two copies of this with two wavelengths and two copies of this with two wavelengths. Now we have single mode multi-core fiber or polarization maintaining multi-core fiber which will be the type of fiber that is used here so now we have everything under the sun we have wavelength division multiplexing we have quarter shot amplitude modulation we have polarization division multiplexing and finally we have spatial division multiplexing where, where you multiplex your data in space essentially because you're occupying different space not just uh, uh, not just a single fiber core now if you do all of that you have 32 times the data rate. So you can imagine if you start from here and you're able to send 10 gigabit per second, here you're going to be sending 320 gigabit per second. And again, people have sent tens of terabits of data in research environment, very, very crazy amounts of data using all of these techniques combined. But this is pretty much the state of the art. Advancements beyond that happen in the architecture that is used to implement this type of system, as well as more complex modulations beyond just 16 quam. But this is it. This is what people are able to do these days. So you can see how much innovation has gone through to bring us here. So now, having said all of that, we started with the polarization controller. So what are we going to do? Well, you can see, as I mentioned here, that as soon as you start putting two data and two different polarization, and if you don't have a polarization maintaining fiber, you can get your polarization scrambled. So a polarization controller allows you to rotate the polarization of light in any orientation that you want. So you can immediately see why that would be useful, because you can put in a data in a certain polarization direction, and you can rotate that polarization direction in anywhere you want. Let's say your fiber has uh, damage the polarization, you can use a polarization controller to correct it, or you want to introduce on purpose some polarization rotation to see if your receiver can still receive data and combat the polarization rotation. So all of these things can be done with the polarization controller that we have. So you either correct impairments or you introduce impairments and make sure that your receiver can fight those impairments and correct for them. So let's take a look at a very practical polarization example that you've seen every day and let's see how that works and then we're going to go ahead and actually use the polarization controller for an experiment. 
So what is a very practical day-to-day -day example of polarization that I'm sure most of you have come across? That would be in a 3D theater. In a 3D theater, you wear glasses that are not, I've taken the frame, uh, the lenses off the glasses on a, on a typical 3D glasses that you wear, wear in the theater. So how does that system actually work? That system has two separate projectors. One projector projects an image that is polarized direction matches your left eye lens, and the other system sends another image which has a vertical or, or a perpendicular polarization to the first one that is sensitive to the other uh, piece that you have in your other glasses. So when you look with your left eye, you're looking through this lens, and you only see the image projected by this projector and not the other one. And when you look for, through this lens, you see the own image projected by this and not by the other one. So how does that work? If I take these two lenses and have them in front of each other, you can see that if I put them in this direction, you cannot see through this at all. You can see it blocks light completely. And that's because this guy polarizes the light in a perpendicular direction as this guy. So when I hold them together, this, the light that is polarized by this glass will not go through this anymore. So you see it as completely being opaque. But if I were to rotate this, you can see it becomes completely transparent because now they both apply polarization in the same direction. So I can show you again, if I rotate 90 degrees, you can see that it completely blocks the light. And if I go back to this orientation, you can see it becomes completely transparent. It's not magic. You can go pick up one of these from a 3D theater and, uh, 3D theater and try it yourself. So essentially, by, by holding them perpendicular to each other, you can see how with, when you look through the light that's polarized by this lens, you cannot see anything through the other one. But if they're in the same polarization direction, you can see perfectly through it. So what, I'm, what I've done here is I have built a little circuit, tiny little circuit here, and I'm using two lenses here with two different polarization and I'm going to shine light through it and we're going to see through the camera and see what that looks like. So what I'm doing is the following. I'm using the Regal DG4162 to generate two different types of waveforms and I'm applying them to two different LEDs. You can see that the two LEDs are right here. One LED is blinking at a rate of uh, 8 Hz and the other one is fading in and out at the rate of 2 Hz. That kind of represents uh, two different data modulations uh, over fiber, for example. Or you could think of these two as being the two projectors that you have uh, in your movie theater. So what I have done here is that I have put a piece of the polariz polarizing uh, uh, film in front of one of the LEDs and a perpendicular one, one that has a uh, polarization direction in the opposite direction in front of the other one. Now, if I hold the camera right here, you can see that you can see both of those uh, lights coming through. So you can see the left and the right has, have different types of modulation on them as to be expected. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this lens in front of, uh, in front of these two. You can see that if I hold it in this direction, you can barely see, you can still see it, but you can barely see the light on the right. And if I turn it 90 degrees, then you can barely see the one on the left. So essentially, this is what you experience in the theater. This is one projector, this is the other projector. With your left eye, you, with your right eye, you only see the projection from the right uh, projector. And oops, and with your left eye, you will see uh, the other way around. There you go. So in this direction, you can see uh, only the light on the left. And in this orientation, you can see the light on the right. So this is the principal op uh, operation of a, a basically a 3D theater uh, projection system where you can go back and forth between the two. You can, you can see that it's not perfectly blocking it, but it's blocking a lot of it. And even though the camera is quite sensitive, so it does uh, um, auto exposure balance and so on, that you can see it even better than that. But anyhow, with, your, with my eyes, I essentially cannot see the left, right now I cannot see any light coming from the left LED and in this orientation I cannot see any light coming from the right LED. So this is the, the main operation, if I remove it of course you see both because the camera is not polarizing at all. So this is the main operation of uh, this type of polarization lenses in a 3D theater. So now we can go ahead and uh, take a look at the polarization controller and also take it apart and see how it works inside. So here's the front of the polarization controller. It essentially has an optical input where you have to connect a fiber optic input that takes signal into the device. And then the device does polarization controller, it controls the polarization and can rotate the polarization inside. And then the signal comes right out of 
the bottom terminal. So essentially, this this guy has almost no loss. It has um, maybe less than 0 0.01 dB of optical loss, and it just simply rotate, rotates the polarization. So if I were to turn it on, it's, it's quite loud, but uh, I hope you can see the screen. But it essentially gives you four numbers: one, two, three, and four. And by rotating these knobs, I can change those numbers. And then numbers can go all the way down to zero. I'm blocking the screen. Let me turn and turn and turn. There it is. All the way to zero. And then the maximum it can reach is, I believe, 999. There it is. 999. So you have about you have 1,000 selections here, 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 and here. So there's 4,000 positions that this can have. So that's 4,000 positions in a 360 degree polarization orientation. So this guy can, has a very, very fine resolution in how accurately it can rotate the polarization direction by less than a, by, by much, much less than a degree. It's 360 degrees divided by 4,000. So it can easily rotate very, the polarization in a really, really fine, fine steps. It also has another mode. Uh, called auto scan, which I will tell you what it is. Basically, when you press auto scan, it just continuously scrambles the polarization. This is a good uh, test for an optical uh, fiber optic network where you put in your fiber, you take the fiber out, you turn on auto scan, and it continually scrambles the polarization, and then you make sure your receiver can keep up with the polarization scrambling to make sure that it will continue to work. And that's it. The rest of the buttons are just instrument uh, setting and recalling the state and uh, the, the getting the data in and out. So the very, very basic, basic instrument to use. Nothing fancy. So what do we need to test it? Or more importantly, how on earth are we going to test this? Because I don't have a, a polarization measurement instrument that can measure the polarization for me. So we have to get a little bit creative. So I don't have a device to measure polarization for me directly, but I have this thing. This is a polarization beam splitter. So everything you he see here is fiber optics. Uh, there, these are all five different types of fiber that is connected here. So this is the input of the polarization beam splitter and these are its outputs. So if I put in light going into this fiber, it goes in through the here and it goes through this little uh, box here that does polarization beam splitting and then two fibers come out of that box. Now these two fibers have exactly perpendicular polarization of light. This is essentially a filter that filters in both the vertical and horizontal polarization and splits them up and outputs them on the two fibers that come out. So for example, if I put in light in here that has exactly vertical polarization, then when it reaches here, all of that light will come through here and none of it will come through the other one. Now, if I put in a light that has polarization in the horizontal direction, then all of the light will come out of here and none of it will come out of this. Now, if I were to be able to put in a light in here that has exactly 45 degree polarization between the vertical and the horizontal, then the light will split evenly between this fiber and that fiber. So this is essentially like a vector device. So meaning that if I have uh, a vector, for example, that is here, this device, the polarization beam splitter, will take the component of that vector in the horizontal direction and put it out of port 1, and it will take the component of that vector that's in the vertical direction and it will put it out of port 2. So you can imagine that if you have a vector that is completely in here, it has no vertical components, all of the light will come out of port 1. And if you have a, a light that has all of its components in this direction, then everything will come out of port 2 and nothing will come out of port 1. So by using this device, if I have a polarization controller, what I can do is I can rotate this vector anywhere 360 degree around and around. And by measuring the power that comes out of this with respect to that, I can measure my polarization. I know exactly what the incident polarization going inside this fiber was. If it was 0 degrees, I would get all power here and none here. If it was 90 degrees, I would get all power here and none there. But by using my polarization controller, I can rotate the light polarization around and around and look at the power and measure the performance of the polarization controller. So what do I need? Well, I need a laser source. Uh, that to give me the light to begin with so I can put it into the polarization controller and then I need the polarization controller and two power sensors in order to measure the power coming out of each of these two and you know it has been I have both of those things so we can go ahead and do this exact experiment and find out how it works 
Now, before we do the experiment, I wanted to go over a few little other things. Fiber optic components and fiber optic connectors are extremely, extremely sensitive. They have to be cleaned every time before you use them, and you have to be very, very careful with them. And there are little subtleties which you may not be aware of, which could actually hurt you if you're not careful. Let's take a look at this fiber. This is a single mode fiber, and it has an input, or it doesn't matter, there's just two, two connectors. And if you look, the body of this connector is black, and the body of this connector is green. Now, you may not pay too much attention to that, but that is very important. In fact, if you look at the polarization beam splitter, this guy's connector has a green uh, attachment at the end, whereas both of the other ones have a black attachment at the end. This is not because this is the input and these are the outputs. This is for a totally different reason. The co fiber optic connectors that have a green connector are angled, means the tip is angled. So I'm gonna try and, if, you, if I can get that on camera so you can see the difference between them. Here we go. Oh, let me see if this guy can focus. Come on, you can do it. There. So I'm going to take the, the protective cover off of these guys without touching them. Now if you see if you can get this on camera or not. If you look carefully, you can see that the white tip of this guy on the right has a slight angle, whereas the tip on the left is perfectly flat. This is called angled PC, this is just called PC. So the one on the right is APC and the one on the left is PC. Now, why would anybody make the tip of these things angled and versus being completely flat? Now, I'm gonna give you a moment to think about that. Remember that the light comes out directly from the center of these guys. There's a tiny, tiny 100 micron uh, fiber in the middle which you cannot see but uh, in, the, in camera, but you can see, the, certainly you can see the angle between the two, two connectors. So why would anybody do that. Let me put these guys back carefully and then I will explain that. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of light propagation. Now, when you connect something, let's say this guy, to another fiber connector, you're basically bringing the two surfaces together. You're attaching the surface, the white surface of one of the connectors and you squeeze it against the surface of the other connector. Now, the light is coming in this direction. If your fiber is perfectly flat, then if there is a discontinuity in the dielectric that's between this guy and this guy, so if there is a difference in the refraction index of the material between this guy and the other connector that you're bringing together, or if there is any air trapped in the middle which has a different index of refraction, then the light that comes here, part of that light will reflect and that reflection depends on the angle of incident. So if, it's ref so if your angle is perfectly flat, you will, most of the light will go through the fiber, but some of it would reflect back. But if it's completely flat, it will reflect back into the fiber that's connecting it. So if you connect two fibers together like this, most of the light will go through, but some of it will reflect back. And if it is perfectly flat, then the reflection reflects back into the fiber that was doing the initial transmission, that's bad because that can interfere with whatever's on the transmitter side. Now imagine that I make this slightly angled. Now even if there is a mismatch in index of refraction, I get reflection, but the reflection is angled and it will go that way as opposed to going directly back into the fiber. So it will reflect off the surface, but it will go in that direction and not back into the fiber that was sending it. In a perfectly flat fiber, it will bounce directly back into the fiber. This is a really simple idea. Just make it a little bit angled so the reflection doesn't go back in the fiber. And that's it, that, that's all, the, all you need to do to solve that problem. And as always, the most brilliant engineering solutions are the simple ones. So for our laser source, I have two options here. I have an Agilent 83433A, which is a uh, 10 gigabit per second light wave transmitter. Now it has an actual mock sender modulator inside which can modulate the light but we don't need that part of it. The only thing we care about is that it has a built-in laser and it has this little, the laser comes out of the fiber connection underneath this little metallic flap and this metallic flap is here so that if you turn the laser on and you have nothing connected to it, this will block the laser from shining out and potentially damaging your eye. Remember everything is infrared, you can't see it. So. Uh, and I also have a laser source in here, but this laser source this is a Febri Perot laser source, and you can go ahead and look it up. Febri Perot laser sources generate multiple tones. That's going to be a little bit of a problem because those, those tones coming out of the Febri Perot laser aren't all in the same polarization direction. Anyhow, and, and this, anyhow, this video is I'm, I'm speaking in relatively high 
level a little bit here because I'm assuming you have some fiber optic background otherwise it's hard to follow but hopefully this would be beneficial for some people so anyhow so we're not going to use the Febri Pro laser but I have a dual power sensor module here inside this uh, light wave controller which can be can be used we can actually use these two channels to measure the power coming out of the two uh, polarization beam splitter output so we can see that both power simultaneously which is very useful so I'm going to turn this guy on this takes a little bit of time to boot and then I will turn on the light wave transmitter as well and right now the key is in the off position because all, all laser instruments have a, uh, a hard key to enable and disable them so this guy is right now in the off position so there is no light coming out now let's make sure this guy is working let's measure it let's measure its wavelength let's measure its uh, power cons uh, power uh, optical power coming out to make sure it's working so for that I'm going to use a HB 86120B uh, multi wavelength meter which allows me to measure the wavelength anywhere from 700 to 1650 nanometers so I'm gonna let that guy boot up a little bit has to warm up so in the meanwhile I'm going to connect uh, I have a single mode fiber here I'm gonna use this single mode fiber so one side of the single mode fiber gets connected to our laser again very very carefully I've already cleaned the fibers as I mentioned before you have to clean them before every time you use them so I'm going to plug this guy in here there we go that's that and I'm gonna preset this guy there's a, there's a minor problem with my wavelength meter here that the laser that the reference laser that's inside has to warm up before it starts working but I think it's okay now so um, one day we'll have to repair the wavelength meter on camera also there we go so I'm gonna connect the other side of this fiber now to the wavelength meter like so Make sure it's per perfectly plugged in. Can't see from there. There we go. There it is. So we have connected the output of the laser directly to our uh, wavelength meter. So everything is good. I don't think you can see the screen of the wavelength meter. Let me turn this off. And I will focus on that afterwards. So I will go ahead. Again, there's, a, there's a, just a single mode fiber connection between the output of the laser and the input of the wavelength meter. And this guy has been turned on and uh, right now it's just reading nothing, so forget about that. I'm going to turn the laser on and you will see the red light come on. There it is. It's been turned on and voila, we should be able to see it. And in fact, we do. Let me raise this guy a little bit. There we go. There it is. Uh, this is 1552.556 nanometer. Now on the instrument, it actually says that the wavelength should be 1552.52. This is 1552.55. So it's 30 picometer away from where it's supposed to be, which is not a problem. Plus, I'm not even sure if the uh, wavelength meter is very well calibrated anyway. And it's putting out 9.42 dBm off of power. If I were to turn the laser off, I'm going to turn it off right now. In case it says no signal, it disappears and turn the laser back on. There it is, 1552.556 nanometer, 9.42 dBm. So, the, so our laser source is in fact working. We have about 10 dBm of power. So we know what to expect coming out of the polarization controller. And you can see right here, uh, the laser is enabled and none of the other ports are connected, which we don't need. We only care about the laser. This guy also has wavelength control, which you can change, but anyhow, that doesn't really affect us. Now, one thing you need to understand is that the light coming out of here is polarized. And this is not a polarization maintaining fiber. This is not a this single mode fiber is not polarization maintaining. So I have to keep it really steady on the table because if I twist it, the polarization changes and then we can't really test the polarization controller that way. So I have to set this up carefully before we can do the experiment. So I'll be right back. Okay, so let me show you what I've done. I've taken the laser directly from the uh, light wave transmitter and the laser comes in through and there's a nice little bundle of fiber there. And then it goes directly to the optical input of the polarization controller. The optical output of the polarization controller goes through a PC to APC converter, which is a flat um, a fiber optic connector to an angled one because this is an angled connector as I described to you earlier but this instrument is both flat connectors so this converter then converts it and then the fiber then follows through here 
goes through the polarization beam splitter as I described to you earlier and the two outputs then both go into my two power sensors. So you can see right now the two power sensors are reading minus 82 and minus 94 dBm which is basically the, pretty much the noise floor of the uh, instrument itself. So that there's nothing coming out right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this camera back here. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ch turn on the laser. So when I turn on the laser, I have already turned on the polarization controller. But the polarization controller right now is, is, is in, it's in its completely default uh, position. So I haven't done any adjustment. So I turn the laser on. There we go. So look what we see. We see 8.4 dBm from one of the fibers, the fiber at the bottom. And we see 2.3, minus 2.3 dBm from the other fiber. So this tells me something. This tells me that the light is, is polarized, but it's not polarized in any of the direction. It's more close to one of the directions than the other because I'm getting much more power from the, the first fiber than the other. But I want to now start rotating the polarization using the polarization controller until I get absolutely minimum power at the top and maximum power at the bottom. Then I know I have hit one of the two polarizations perfectly. So let me try and do that. Now I'm going to uh, go ahead and and start uh, fiddling with these knobs see if I can get uh, it looks like I'm going in the wrong direction it's not as easy as it seems there we go so this doesn't tell you much so at least might as well look at the numbers so what I'm trying to do is by rotating the polarization I'm trying to minimize the top number and maximize the bottom number let's see okay I'm kind of going in the right direction Let's start from the other knob. Nope, wrong direction. Okay, getting better. There we go. So this this means that I'm moving closer and closer to one of the two polarizations, the vertical polarization. There we go. Perfect. This is working really well. Oh, now I'm going backwards, going to the other knob. There we go. Nope. This is very, very sensitive. So I'm going to continue searching until I hit it right. So I've saved two rough states between the two polarization modes. So here, again, this thing keeps sh shifting around because I don't have a polarization maintaining fiber in the setup. But what's important to note is that I have one setting right now where I have almost all the power coming from the bottom fiber and very little from the top fiber. And I can actually switch the order of that uh, by uh, loading the other state that I saved. So I'm going to go ahead and recall the other state. There we go. And I, you can see by recalling the other state, the opposite polarization, I'm actually able to switch the order of those two. And the way I do that is by simply basically coming here. Um, I cannot see the camera anymore. Here we go. So I have uh, I've saved two states. One state is, is these numbers that you see uh, represent the polarization that you just saw. And uh, the other state I can just go recall uh, from here and I can change this to state number one and I can reload that. And then it will load a totally different set of numbers that represents the other polarization state. Now, what I was saying about not having a polarization maintaining fiber, I'll show you why that is so critical and why these systems are so difficult to build. Um, look at the numbers right now. I'm going to just play around with this fiber. You can see, look, I, all I'm doing is I'm rotating this fiber like that. I'm putting a little bit of pressure on it, giving it a little bit of torque. You can see the polarization just shifts all over the place by, by that simple rotation of the fiber. Now, we're going to see why that is that can actually be useful because this means that by rotating the fiber, by twisting the fiber, I can actually change its polarization. So that means that I can do that and actually in a controlled way and be able to get polarization controllers. So when we take the instrument apart, we will see that in a little bit more detail. One other thing this instrument does is that, it, if you remember, I told you it does polarization scrambling. So I'm going to go ahead and enable polarization scrambling and I'm going to there you go leave it here now look at these numbers right now it's scrambling the polarization and you can see that how the, the power coming out of the two fibers 
is just going to continuously rotate around. It's going to go from all the way from one side all the way to the other side. Right now, it's most of it is from the bottom fiber. And if you wait long enough, the position is going to switch. Again, this is a random, so it's going to go back and forth between the two between the two fibers in terms of uh, the way the power is, gets divided. I can change the rate so it does it a bit faster. There you go. Now you can see it's going the other way. It's just totally scrambled. So the polarization is rotating around and around in, in, a, in a random way and we will see how that is done inside the instrument as well but by essentially you can by building this setup by using a polarization beam splitter we are able to verify the functionality of the uh, polarization controller so here I've taken the top cover of the polarization controller off uh, there was just one screw to take off to do that you can see how it is made in two separate compartments here we have the power supply completely separated and isolated and if you remember I said there was something wrong with it, it wouldn't turn on I just took the cover off and I touched this connector right here and all of a sudden it came back to life so there was really nothing wrong with it but anyhow aside from that um, everything else seems to be working we did the test we verified the functionality now the actual polarization controlling mechanism is inside this box uh, protected and also uh, this is a, a fairly heavy box so that there's no vibration and so on all the digital circuitry that controls the interfaces, the display and the buttons are all on the opposite side of this box they're sitting underneath it it's not really very interesting it's just a bunch of microcontroller ICs and a few switches and so on what's interesting is is what is in here so let's take it apart this has four screws I'll torque I'll uh, torque screws, so let's take that off and then we get to see it in action and there we go take this off and here it is now if you have ever seen a manual polarization controller you recognize these paddles right away these paddles you can actually buy a manual polarization controller where you rotate the paddles yourself by hand in order to get the polarization that you want but for us it's much more interesting to see it done this way so let's take a close look at it so there's two fibers that come into the system the fiber from the front goes in here right at the bottom left of the screen which you cannot see there we go there it is so the fiber comes through from here goes through here these two two little red uh, connections that you see those are fiber coming in so the fiber comes in here goes through the middle of this stepper motor goes right through these paddles goes this way comes back out this way and comes back out out this way so if you look carefully up, I'll take the camera close in, there is a piece of fiber between these two paddles and there's a piece of fiber between these two paddles. The, the instrument is literally twisting the fiber this way and this way in order to get the polarization orientation that it wants to do. Remember, I, as I showed you by using single mode fiber, if you twist the fiber, you change its polarization. Now that's predictable. If you can do that in a really controlled way and calibrate it out, then you can determine the polarization exactly from the way the fiber is rotated. So these two paddles actually have a fiber in the middle of them like this, and they rotate this way and this way in order to twist the fiber because the fiber is, is screwed in between them. So the fiber comes in through here, goes through here, comes back out of there, and by changing these paddles, you can get the polarization that you want. So let's turn it on. There we go. You can see how the paddles moved briefly and then and then came into their uh, initial location. So right now it's at it's in its default location. Now these paddles also have these metal pieces that extend out. They go in between these optical detectors so that they know that this paddle has reached the other end because otherwise you're going to keep rotating and eventually the fiber is going to snap because you can't continuously twist it. You can't continuously twist the fiber over and over again. So by there is four optical detectors and those four optical detectors uh, use these pieces of metal that come out of the paddles in order to detect where they've reached their final location so what we can do is the cool thing to see is for example if I rotate one of the paddles you can see by ro I'm, I'm rotating the knob in the front of the instrument and that rotates this paddle left and right like that now if I put it into scan mode where it does polarization scrambling like so it's going to continue to scramble the polarization and I can increase the rate 
There it is. This is as fast as it can do it. So right now it's continuously scrambling the polarization, it's twisting the fiber back and forth in order to give you all kind of polarization and orientation. You can see the speed of each of the four paddles is different. So that, and they, the speeds are not multiples of each other so that the, the relative positions of the paddles continuously changes with respect to each other. This is true polarization scrambling. It's not doing it very fast. Modern polarization scramblers can do it much faster. This is the fastest this can be done. And I think there was a date somewhere on there to see when this was made. I'll find out. Uh, but it's pretty old, I would imagine. So, there you go. You can see there's a piece of fiber in the middle that is getting twisted left and right. Let me take this out, get a closer look of everything. There we go. Can you take a closer look for your enjoyment? It's kind of crazy to watch them go like that. But you can see how they stop once the metal pieces reach the optical detectors. You can see, for example, the one that's moving the fastest, as soon as it reaches the optical detector, it goes the other way. Like so. Everything else is pretty straightforward. You can see the stepper motors have connections that go to the uh, motherboard. The circuitry is really, really simple. There's nothing fancy going on there. Most of, most of the innovation in a circuit like in, in a system like this is making the calibration work and making sure it's built to precision and uh, the fiber is nicely uh, going through and anyhow you know, it's more of a manufacturing complexity than a circuit complexity and you can see there's a closer there's a fan there to blow and cool the uh, stepper motors as they get hot as time passes and the fan is making quite a bit of noise uh, there is the power supply there there's the filter of course on the connect and the connector and the front panel you've already seen Pretty straightforward. Other than that, it's a really simple instrument, but really cool and hypnotic to watch as it goes back and forth. And so there you go. Now you see and now you know, not only do you know all the different types of fiber optic communication schemes, but you've also now seen the inside of a polarization controller. And more importantly, now we know how to test the polarization controller, what kind of instruments are required what we need to connect, what a polarization beam splitter is, and so on. So, there, that's about it. I think this video is already pretty long. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that the, uh, the high-level topic was uh, still beneficial to most of you about fiber optic communication. So, as always, uh, leave a comment, uh, rate the videos, and uh, this, you know, create, create a discussion. You can come to the forum, or you can discuss it on Dave's forum, where I usually post these videos as well. And uh, uh, let's keep going and hopefully I'll come up with something uh, interesting next time as well.